Yay, just to get us going. Host disabled participating screen. Uh, Felipe, I need to share my screen. Share screen. Okay. Hey, Sarah. So can everybody see my screen? Yeah, I can, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, I wanna start out with just business. If you go to the website, website and you go and you just click on this, don't go any farther, You're, this screen will come up with the program. And our next meeting is December the 1st. And it's another virtual meeting. And this was Sheila's idea. I think it's a great idea. I want people to, uh, she wanted everybody to share a case that they did that they thought was interesting and challenging and that they wanted to you know, share. This is sort of along the lines with what uh, uh, Luke did, it does with things that we love, but this would be cases that we've loved. Now, the only way this is going to work is if everybody shares their case and they got to, they don't have to necessarily put it together, but you got to give Sheila a break and help her put this together. So we will be sending an email to everybody with a template. So you can just upload your cases. You don't have to get super fancy and do it, but just all you need is a good, we'll send the template, you fill out the template, and then uh, we will help put it together so that it works on, uh, on um, Zoom. Um, along those lines uh, for the meetings, if you don't respond to emails, the, we, we can't give you CE credit. The only way for people to get CE credit is if you uh, respond to the emails because you're going to get surveys. We're working on p real pace uh, um, CE and um, it requires that you respond to a, and do a survey. So when you get the surveys sent to you, don't just blow them off. You need to fill them out. Okay. And again, um, any, if you want information, go to the website and just click here. For the meeting and to apply, you know, if, if you have a friend that wants to come this year, everything's free. You just have them go to apply for Renaissance. And the reading list for the meeting will always be there. Okay. So when you're doing, when you're working on this, if there's some literature you want to add to it, that will be added to the, leaning, the, the reading list. Okay. The format tonight is going to be pretty much Keith's going to do what we've always done, talk about meetings. And the literature, obviously, because there's a whole lot of literature. He's not hey, 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 hey. Hey, no, but it's good literature. Um, that was supposed to be a positive thing, Dr. Progovin. <laughs> and um, anyway, um, the, the only other thing that I want to talk about is, uh, I'm going to pop this up. We, uh, and this is not so much of a plug for us, but um, for, but for tonight, if you go and you go to chat, okay, you click on chat, you can, and you click on more, you can raise your hand, you can uh, at, and ask a question and stuff, and I'll be looking for pe people's comments. Keith can't lecture and answer questions. So if you have, if you want to ask a question, just use the, the chat function. I'll get Keith's attention and then he can answer your question, okay? So to remember, go down to chat and, and then click on more and then you can make comments, you can raise your hand, you can ask us to go slower, go faster, anything like that. Um, I don't know if Armando is, um, or the office is going to have a virtual open house. We do this every year and this is not just for mm -hmm. cosmetic surgery. If you have patients that have myofascial pain or um, headaches related to myofascial pain. Uh, this sale for fillers and Botox is significant de de discount. We're talking like up to, you know, over 50% discount and it's one day only. So if your patients are looking for Botox or fillers, um, keep an eye on this date and, uh, and get them on the email list. And doesn't, it is not necessarily for uh, facial cosmetic surgery, 
but if they want facial cosmetic surgery, we will be happy to provide that. <laughs> yeah. Really? So that's a plug for Dr. Ratana. Um, anyway, everything is now is virtual. If you don't respond to the emails, you make it super hard on Jeannie. So please respond to the emails. Don't tr make sure that the stuff that comes through for the Renaissance doesn't go into your spam. And uh, with that, I am going to turn this over to Dr. Progerman. Jax. Thank you, RW. Hi, everybody. Hey, Keith. Hi. Great. So well, just, to, just so everybody knows, we have about almost 30 people on the meeting right now. So that's our typical meeting. That's great. Okay, are we, uh, are we good, RW? You're ready. Go ahead. On Study Club, I don't have the panelists up here. 2020. Sorry. I think also if any everybody mutes their microphone, we won't get noise, background noise or feedback. Okay, so the um, the theme for tonight is um, obviously I don't know why I put the capital in there, but it's uh, it's called Science Matters, and uh, I think that's near and dear to everybody's heart, no matter your political persuasion or any of those things. We're not going to get involved in any of that stuff, but I, I think we all commonly agree that science is important. And, hey, Felipe, thank goodness we have Felipe here. Just click, okay. To this whole year, we don't have any sponsorship. This is totally member supported. And, uh, but really, we have Felipe, Armando, and RW um, sharing a lot of uh, time and effort. So we should really shout out and thank them uh, because uh, this is on their dime, even though, um, you know, we're not getting any sponsorship. So this is our um, new format for 2020 and 2021, Renaissance Study Club, moving forward. Yes, I know, this is my fashion. I, uh, I gave everybody 11 literature articles and I just want you to understand that literally this took me several months to put together. If you notice, all of them are in the year 2020. Yeah, most of them are, have been referenced uh, within the past three months. So you can't get any more current than these articles. And you'll notice that we're going to expand or evolve in the articles in complexity. And, uh, and the last three articles are just over the top. So science matters. Welcome to the new reality. Speaking of the new reality, uh, you can't lecture without uh, COVID-19. So uh, the pandemic has affected all of us. And, uh, and let's just take a little quick uh, journey through time. And this was the first CDC uh, publication and, and it's just crazy to think that the world changed in 2020. But uh, the most amazing thing, this is from the original uh, CDC. And if you're having trouble breathing or if your lips turn blue, go to the hospital. Well, let me tell you something. If my lips turn blue, brother, I think it's a little too late for that. So, uh, but we learned a lot. And, um, and then, of course, D.C., as Maryland and Virginia, um, stay at home. And literally, we were closed for two to three months. And uh, that totally changed our perspective. This is a new reality. And you can complain. You could say, I want to go back to the 1950s or, or just uh, 2019. But this is uh, the way we walk around now. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm tired at night. I'm oxygen deprived. And uh, it's, uh, it's a struggle uh, to wear my N95 all day long. But I think uh, that's the new reality. It's a must. So uh, you got to shout out 
to the people that I think helped us, the Renaissance, the ADA, and the DC Dental Society. Um, they were invaluable in distributing up-to-date information, whether you like them or not, for me, they were really helpful. And I tried, as, as everybody during our COVID reality shared, a lot of good information. We reopened in June of 2020, but I don't know about you, um, I had struggles. And it was difficult to, to uh, I rehired my staff, but after paying people to sit at home, um, they enjoyed that. And they got paid their full salary the whole time during COVID, and they did not want to come back to work. So I had to put together a PowerPoint presentation or keynote, and I made it mandatory for everybody to come to the office. And I think for me, this was a game changer. It wasn't about me, it was about all of us working together as a team. And I had to prove to them the science and the reality that if we adhered to the CDC and OSHA guidelines, that we were gonna be okay. But um, you know, you can't overlook the fact that everybody's been touched by COVID. These are challenging times for our family, our staff, our patients, and also our business. So, back to the science. Okay, the first two articles kind of relate to COVID. Uh, there are so many articles in our current literature describing the new reality of COVID. Let's talk about synergy. And I don't know if everybody gets the International Journal of Power and Restorative. Uh, this is Mark Nevins. He's the um, uh, editor up in Boston. And, and I think this typifies who we are. This is the Renaissance Study Club. Whether you're a specialist, general dentist, I don't care who you are. We all help each other out. And, and that's basically what this article is saying. Uh, a team of people, a community, helping each other out, whether getting PPP loans through Ricardo, NIH for some of us, uh, Sandy Spring, whatever it is, sharing the latest information to create a better community for each one of us. And that's basically what the article is saying. Obviously, this is coming from Boston. So Boston strong, we're stronger together, and that's absolutely true of the Renaissance Study Club. After 30 years, we've evolved where we're not in competition with each other. We're here to share information and help each other to create a better life. The second article on your list uh, is the latest of the Journal of Prosthodontics. And it's basically an up-to-date, it, it's not even been published yet, it's been submitted, the latest uh, uh, way we practice with COVID-19. All the things you know already, your N95, your level three mask, your aerosol spray. I thought this was a fantastic up-to-date. This was just published in September of 2020, and um, it's everything that we do already in our practices. I'm rolling through all 11 literature review. Okay, so I just have to put things in perspective because it's really amazing how up to date, how cutting edge the Renaissance Study Club really is. So th this is early uh, 2015. This is six years ago now. And back then I was lecturing on promising, proving new technologies. Again, for several years, we're talking about virtual treatment planning, digital implant diagnostics. Wow, wouldn't you know, guided surgery, static dynamic guides, and also regeneration. So uh, that, that was six years ago, almost 10 years ago, we've talked about the same thing. I also shared with the group that zirconia, be careful, buyer beware, abutments, bridges, things like that. Um, and true to date, even now, I'm at a 50% success rate for zirconia, which means that there's a 50% failure rate. I'm not a big fan of zirconia. And then we talked about digital clinical uh, dentistry. We had Joe Carpentieri the year before, and he talked about digital islands. So it's kind of interesting. That was six years ago. And um, where have we gone in six years? Well, obviously, there's tons of literature on virtual treatment planning, on guided technology, 
and digital implant diagnostics. This is just one of the latest ones in the journal Prosthodontics saying that uh, all the things we've been doing for the past six, eight, 10 years is actually being studied scientifically and proven. So this isn't promising new technology. This is now proven technology in 2020 and 2021. And our W has many more articles than just this, but um, this is now adopted almost universally, virtual treatment planning. In 2016, um, the theme then was restorative update. Uh, the big thing back then, um, well, five years ago, was originally manufactured parts versus clone manufacturers. And there was a big uproar, and the FDA came out to say that you have to have 510K approval. There are still aftermarket parts on the market. And I, I, I think the sad reality now is that, that labs and, and actually our businesses are struggling for some people and uh, using clone manufacturers or aftermarket parts is cheaper. And uh, it, it is about the bottom line. So be careful. There are now many, many articles that are published in the literature saying that originally manufactured parts, they matter. And that's important. So you get support. So COVID hit, I was literally shut down for three months and so were the labs. So were the implant manufacturers. So our supply chain was interrupted. And this picture illustrates, you know, the plethora of what's going on out there. We have a, a Strauman brand new year old BLX implant. I don't know how many people have used it. Uh, the two in the middle are bone level implants. And then, and then the one all the way to the right is the narrow bone level implant. All, all four um, are several, three different technologies. So because COVID hit, Strauman, Nobel, 3i, all the major manufacturers laid off people, they furloughed people, Literally, their manufacturing, their supply chain got interrupted. We reopened. People are coming in for their implant impressions. I'm sending the cases out to Strawman, all these manufacturers, and they're telling me we have weeks of delay, months of delay. So the BLX implant is uh, relatively new. It's been out a year now. You cannot use a gold UCLA abutment. The only way to do this is two ways, with a tie base or machined milled titanium. Who knew that COVID would have such a dramatic impact on implant manufacturing? So literally when I sent this case out, there was at least a month delay in getting the case back from Strawman to just mill one part, which is incredible. So the turnaround time for these gold UCLA, the ones in the middle, the bone level, which has a waxing sleeve, which you cast gold to, literally we have a week or 10 day turnaround time. To now complicate things and have a month, the same thing for the narrow or the narrow bone level, the small diameter, you don't have a gold UCLA option. The only option you have is machine milled CAD CAM milled titanium done in Texas. Well, Texas was hit hard with COVID. Many of the workers were affected by COVID, literally delaying our manufacturing and our parts. So the effect of COVID, tremendous. Again, the mix of analog, old world, 30 years, gold UCLA abutment, and now new digital technology, machine mill titanium abutments. But who knew that COVID would have such an impact? Again, our supply chain was interrupted. Um, so the workaround, and be careful, you know, labs are trying to get creative. They wanna please dentists, and basically um, the, the labs I work with are good, honorable people, but uh, they have to make a living too and a workaround. 
So, so what's a workaround in English? A workaround that the lab suggested because they had such a hard time getting those machine mill titanium parts, the workaround was a three millimeter titanium base, tie base. They were gonna cast gold to it, wax and cast, and then they were gonna cement a gold custom abutment to a tie three millimeter base. On top of that, they were gonna cement a porcelain fused to metal crown. Well, what do you think is gonna happen? The bond from the Thai titanium machine base is gonna break down because um, it's not meant gold to cement to titanium and eventually I'm gonna have a problem. So be careful about workarounds or compromises. If, you, if you're gonna use this, wait the month and get a machine mill titanium abutment. OEM parts. As of last week, Strawman now is up and running and so are the other companies. And now they promise that uh, with their new implants and narrow diameter that you will be able to use a gold UCLA abutment. They promise. We'll see. Pete? Yes. So comment on new implants that aren't new. A lot of the new implant, the new implants are uh, old designs. So hold that, RW. Yeah. It, it, uh, wait two slides and okay. we'll be there. Uh, we're we're going to talk about, about how nothing is really new. Right. Just repackaged and, um, and hold that thought. Any, any, how are we doing so far? Good. We have thumbs up. Everybody good? Everybody hear me? Perfect. Russ, good? Okay. Terrific. Very good. I want to give you the latest the latest on what's happening. Okay. So um, now four years ago, 2017, we talked about the relationship of surgery and restorative. And, and now finally, RW's XNAV um, has come to fruition and um, his accuracy and precision allows us to take my dream of guided restorations to be a reality. So we have the old concept of digital implant diagnostics, virtual treatment planning. We have our W's tried and true now, guided surgery, but now we're messing with guided restorations um, and, and with the accuracy being that close or that good, we're able to see this as a reality, almost. Okay, so let's talk about 3D printed. Because last year I showed you a case that we did um, that didn't work out so well. Uh, 3D printed materials for provisionals, for temporary abutments, for healing components, guided. We're still in the, um, we're still in the early learning curve and uh, my prosthodontic colleagues across the country um, uh, have had problems. Problems with 3D printed provisionals fracturing being brittle, um, color not so good, strength, durability not quite as good as milled or CAD CAM materials. So, uh, but one thing that COVID has created is innovation. And uh, according to Jamie Progovan, you'll see our next 3D printed um, uh, materials for dental education. So Jamie's uh, at Louisville and uh, Jerry Grant is um, the prosthodontist and, and he is the digital uh, implant or, or digital prosthodontic master. And um, they are now this article, the latest article uh, in 2020, Journal of Prost, is for dental education to prep teeth on, on deniform teeth but instead they're 3D printed teeth to have models for, um, um, to have models for preps for veneers, things like that. Instead of using deniform teeth, which literally are so costly, now with 3D printed technology, dental education can use things better, more cheaply. So um, 
So it's much more cost effective as published in the article and the dental students love it for inlays, crowns, adhesive bridges, veneers, all those things to practice. It's, um, it's working out quite well. So that's one great benefit. Okay, journey through time. 2018, three years ago. This is kind of interesting. Classic concepts and techniques in a contemporary world. So I have the, the latest uh, iPhone. I am a, uh, a big Nikon photography fan. I, I, I can't believe I'm gonna say, but um, I don't need my Nikon camera anymore because I, this little phone takes amazing pictures. And um, I have 4K video now. So um, both new and old world technology, blending of analog and digital dentistry. Okay, the next article is, uh, and I love this journal, Compendium, July 2020. In Compendium, they take implant dentistry and, and the whole journal article is, is focused on implant dentistry. So July 2020 is all about implants. This article in particular is, is, is fully digital dental implant treatment a reality. Marcus Abood, um, Marcus uh, uh, published many articles at Stony Brook. Um, he was there and he was the expert on CBCT technology, uh, Southern Illinois, uh, along with many others, um, he, he, uh, he went there. Um, this article um, really asks, is fully digital possible in 2020 by three of the uh, top people in our field? Um, let's take Marcus's um, uh, version of that because I, I think this is uh, really well written. So, so again, we talked about this for many years now. And Marcus is publishing this in July of 2020, thinking of how far ahead, how cutting edge the Renaissance Study Club is. He's talking about the superimposition of a DICOM file from a CBCT, an STL from an intraoral scan, that allows the visualization between bone, teeth, and soft tissue. Something that we have been talking about and using for almost 10 years now, with accurate anatomic representation. But there is a new spin on this. And the new spin is they now are incorporating JPEG images and 4K video into this technology, which I think is the coolest. So, uh, so not only do we have DICOM and CBCTs, STL files, but now we're incorporating a JPEGs and 4K technology and uh, photorealistic 3D, they really call, call it 4D digitization and facial aids. And I think that's a, that, that's a shout out to people like Christian Coachman and others. Okay. Also part of this article is the restorative design and implant placement planning. Static surgical guide, something we've been talking about a long time, when indicated. He also talks about prosthetic components such as customized abutments, temporary crowns can be manufactured prior to surgery. He talks about static guides, tooth, bone, and mucosa borne. And again, planning is critical. You can, you can use guides that are printed milled or stereolithography. They could be fabricated in the dental lab. So blending of analog and digital dentistry. Again, he's talking about, you know, utilizing all the things we've been doing for decades, analog, but incorporating them in a, a digital world. And he calls it a hybrid workflow. This is published July of 2020. Can we be totally digital? And the answer is predictably, reliably, not. Single tooth, quadrant, 
better. Full arch, not as good. So he talks about the best of both worlds. And I think right now, that's where we are. Again, in his conclusion, digital, digital implant workflows are opening new, innovative, more accurate ways of definitely treatment planning compared to old uh, analog ways. He talks about static and dynamic guided surgery, surgery following the digital trend. And again, you know, the use of provisional restorations, which we're gonna get to. Um, a, a, a nice overview article on can we go purely digital? Okay. 2019, I talked about 30 years, success, failures, issues in implant dentistry. Back then, uh, uh, Morty Amsterdam, some of the pioneers of Perio Prost had passed away the year before, so we paid homage to them and we talked about really multidisciplinary treatment planning execution, case reports. Okay, this is uh, the part where when they video you, I, I really enjoy lecturing just to the Renaissance Study Club and no video. But again, honesty is what the Renaissance is all about. So this is a good friend of mine, Rick Smith. He's in with Dennis Tarnow. And it's very innovative. They're, they're talking about immediate implants in molar extraction sockets. And, and this article I didn't send to you because I'm not advocating this at all. But I'm advocating real world problems when people do things. So the point of this is, can it be done? Can we place an immediate implant into a molar extraction socket and can it work? And here we see, oh, here we see an implant into forcation bone. So we got implant stability, but what's the big problem with that? There's a hope and a prayer that the rest of the implant will actually integrate. But we have a bigger issue. And the bigger issue is small diameter implant replacing a large molar. There's a problem, Houston. And this is the problem. So I inherited this case from two famous people. They are on the lecture circuit. They are well regarded. And, and this was a transfer case to me. This had just been restored last year, pre-COVID, by a fantastic team up in Boston. You know them. They are on the circuit. And I got this case from them. And, and this is how they restored the case. You could see crestal bone loss. You could see that the implant was placed in a less than optimum position. You can also see that the smaller diameter implant replacing a huge molar is a problem. But this is the biggest problem. The contact point is closed. And when you run floss between this contact point, it's good. But when you talk to the patient, every time they eat, they collect food. They impact food. And after only one year with the restoration, peruse. What happens? They get gross decay on the proximal surface because if they collect enough food, it's a problem. So food impaction, food collection, you know, the old adage, size matters. But contact points and emergence profile, it matters too. So this case was done by a famous Boston team, but this case was done by, by, by a great team, Emory and Progabin. And right here, this is actually an older case, platform switched implant, great crestal bone preservation, but this is what I want you to focus on. Broad proximal contact areas, not a point. And here, let's show you broad proximal contact areas. When it flames, it's bad. To the left is a point contact with food impaction. The, the radiographs on the right, whether it be posterior, 
It's a broad contact area. You can also accomplish that on the anterior. And here we have a long contact area so that we preserve papilla and more important, we don't impact food and we don't get decay on the adjacent proximal contact. Everybody got that? I see this so much. I see patients come in and they complain about food collection and food impaction. Even though they have great contact, it's a point contact. Keith, there's yes. a question. There's a question about position of the implant mesial distal. Can you comment on the position of the implant mesial distal and why it's, oh, it seems to be too distal? Well, you know, when you're trying to, uh, it's a good question. It's a good question. It's hard to take a look at a two-dimensional radiograph. But if you look, um, hold, hold that question. Your question is, where is the implant relative to the crown? And a um, couple of slides later, I'm going to show you um, how you're supposed to position the implant, where it matters, mesiodistal, buccolingual, relative to the tooth that we're replacing. Can I, can I ask a question? Wait, one more. Do you, do you, was this a guided case, Keith? The Boston this. case? Yes. Was it guided? I don't know. And more I, than likely, unfortunately, it probably wasn't, because this is an old implant design, I think. Um, it's, and, actually, it's actually platform source, do you see? Yeah, well, that's, yeah. it's not that old, but the, that. Um, I think Dr. Uh, Van Stralen shared with me a really nice teaching slide once that showed when you look down into the mouth, you have the, the um, visual restorative space and they have the available restorative space. And no matter what, you oftentimes see implants placed by good surgeons that are a little too distal. And it's because that's when they look in the mouth, that's what they see. Correct. The other problem with that is when you have, when you're treatment planning virtually and you have an, a, a tooth like this, and this is more contemporary, you're going to have <clears throat> a lot of uh, artifact up here and it's gonna make the crown look bigger than it actually is. And sometimes you may go a little too mesial. So now sometimes we have to be more careful about our treatment planning when we're looking and we're using only a CBCT and not an intraoral scan. And again, this goes back to Keith's previous comments about using the fused STL files with the DICOM files. You don't want to use DICOM files to plan single tooth because a tooth like this is going to look bigger on the CT when you're planning and you plop a virtual implant in here. You're not really going to know where the contact is because you can't see it on a CT. So whoever, I mean, I want to ask the question. It was a good question and it's led to some other. Questions. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, just look at the emergence profile. I mean, from what you guys did and what's done on the left. I mean, the position of that implant dictates a ridge lap or way over home, where the, the emergence profile on the extra on the right is uh, equal on mesial and distal. Right. And I think that's keeping the crestal bone position in an ideal location. When you look on the extra on the left, your, that bone on the mesial is definitely going and the distal. But the emergence profile, I think, is dictating that. So, so we're going to spend the rest of the night on, on one concept in a sec. Keith, Keith, Keith I got, can I just ask a quick question to RW? Yeah. Can you just restate what you said about using a DICOM file for a single tooth implant? So depending on the quality of the DICOM, and that's going to depend on the adjacent teeth. When you have uh, any metal artifact, I mean, I'm not, I can't, I don't have a pointer here to use, but if you look at that number, let's say this is number 30 and 31. Uh -huh. If you look on 31, you got metal here. 
Right. When you take a CT, that metal is going to create an artifact and it's going to make the crown look bigger than it is. And even zirconia can do that. So and so when you start using 31 appear bigger. Yeah, it's going to make it's going to make it look bigger. Now this is an old case, I assume. It's not that old. Um, what? I, I, I don't think their case is that old. Well, <laughs> I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be. But how uh, does that, how is that implicated in the actual placement of the implant? If it's, if it's so minor, I understand it might affect virtual placement of a crown, but does that really affect the placement of the implant? It affects the, the treatment planning of the implant. People don't understand that once you start doing guided surgery, you, you move into a different problem. When you do analog treatment planning, your cognitive ability to plan is based upon your vision. When you start doing digital treatment planning, your cognitive ability to plan is based upon your understanding of the digital images. And the endodontists understand this a lot because they run into the problem. But until you've done a lot of implant surgery with guided surgery, you don't understand how bad you are at planning and understanding and making, uh, uh, making changes based on the images and the quality of the images that you're working with. When you work with metal or zirconia, it, screw, it messes up the images. And so things look bigger than they are because of artifact. Thank you. Thank you. And the, w the way around it is you use STL files. Right. Okay. Okay. So you go from image image accuracy and of 400 to 300 microns. When you use fused images, you're using a 25 micron STL file. You fuse it with a 400 to 300 micron CT, and you get an 80 micron image accuracy that you can work with. That's what the literature says. So you de you really need intraoral scans to to properly treatment plan and you really use the intro. I'll just cut the STL file right out. Okay. Yeah, let's talk about I mean, the DICOM file. I'm sorry. Thanks. Th thank you, Dr. Henry. Uh, let, let's talk about ideal implant abutments. Slots and grooves for retention and resistance form. Smooth surface on your gum line, which may or may not be accurate anymore. So some people are now advocating to get cell adhesion, uh, to have a slightly roughened surface touching soft tissue. Anyway, we're gonna spend the rest of the night on emergence profile. If you need to, you could see a dimple in your access, screw access chamber. Obviously, if it's cement retained, you want your margin at your tissue level and you want it to be scalloped. You want a broad proximal contact area area, broad, so three-dimensionally broad. Okay, last year I talked about aesthetic integration 2020. We talked about different implant abutment materials, implant crown work, 30-year perspective on what works and what doesn't work. So this is interesting, Jamie Brogan at Louisville. Remember, implant companies uh, in general are talking about cost efficiency. And, and they're trying to make everybody move into the same box. So this is not a new concept. This is an older concept. This is a comb, um, cobalt chrome metal that's actually milled. So this is new, coming on the market, but not really new. It's being repackaged by Strauman and others. Why? Because they have these milling centers and they want to be profitable. They want to be efficient. So this is now on the market. You, you could have a, a cobalt chrome, cementable, uh, machine milled, not titanium, but cobalt chrome abutment. The literature is really not too uh, good on, on, um, on whether this is a good material, long lasting. And again, if you use an all ceramic, on top of the cobalt chrome, sometimes you have compatibility issues. So uh, it's being repackaged by companies now. So not sure. Cobalt chrome, does it work? Didn't work back then, 
Maybe it'll work now. This is this is new. Er. Okay. Let's get to tonight. 2020, 2021. What is the rest of the evening going to talk about? Our clinical decision making based on the literature and evidence-based science. Where are we? Science matters. Oh. Oh. Can everybody see me? I, I, um, I, I can't stand because I'm out, but I actually have short, shorts on. This is the first time I've actually worn a jacket, a tie, and a shirt in seven months. And I, I wanted to show you that I came to the office and I was wearing my orange N95 mask. So if you can believe masks are important, and science matters. Okay, nobody's in the room with me, and therefore, I'm okay taking my mask off. I don't know how many people have attended meetings, polls I'm gonna go over. I'm gonna go really uh, in depth on literature view. But the whole point is, knowledge today for a better practice tomorrow. Okay, implant dentistry and bow ties. I didn't wear my bow tie, but let's talk about Clark Stanford. And I really think as a, as a value or mission statement, uh, P.I. Brannemark was the father of modern day implants. And um, it, this is what he's quoted to say, and that's what uh, uh, Clark Stanford, he always wore bow ties, uh, but that's not what's important. What Brown and Mark said, and, and our, our father of modern day implants, the power of science, detail, documentation, trust, integrity, and of course, excellence. And, and these are Brown and Mark's qualities or core values. And I think that sums up what the Renaissance Study Club has been for the past 30 years. So uh, nice little tidbit, and this is who we are and why we're here. Okay, another tidbit, again, that was from the Academy of Osseo News, and this is from uh, uh, the American College of Prosthodontic, our newsletter. This is the editor-in-chief, editor and he's got, talking about true mastery, whether it's the 10,000-hour rule, and Jamie Progabin is, is – is going to a PROS program hopefully next year for three years. And, and we always thought that if you're lucky, after 10,000 hours of hard work, focus, dedication, and practice, that you will become a master. Well, Jamie, um, in this article, Takumi uh, got it wrong or got it right. And uh, we're now at the 60,000 hour rule. So now in this article, Takumi, the Japanese say 10,000, that's okay, 60,000, and if you're lucky, you have the chance after 30 years of hard work of potentially becoming a master at whatever you do. So um, I hate to raise the bar higher, but, um, but that's what we're about, raising the bar as high as we can make it. Okay, what's trending now? What's happening now in the literature across the board? And what's happening now is Kim Knoll nailed it. Emergence profile. And now the literature is coming out in great detail on, on why we do what we do and how to make it better. We have this thing called implant dentistry and the whole goal is to replicate nature. And now we've gotten so good that we could pre predictably, reliably replicate nature. And so now we're gonna talk about a balancing act between aesthetics, health, and function. And, and that's what the remaining articles are all about. We're gonna talk about how we can optimize emergence profile in great detail. We're also going to talk about the natural tooth and how an implant is round. Natural teeth aren't round. So already we have a problem. The equalizer is the abutment. We'll talk about the subcritical and critical zones. 
We'll talk about, is there a difference between anterior and posterior restorations, implants, restorative? We'll talk about this really cool concept called immediate provisionalization versus delayed. Lose the soft tissue and try to regain it or never lose it. Okay, if you can get all three, you're lucky. Aesthetics, health, and function. It's a balancing act of all these three. If you're lucky, you get all three. So I went through 30,000 photographs digital that I have, and I just picked out random abutments and crown contours. This is all about the next hour or less on emergence profile. So we can see uh, this is an older case. This is a zirconia abutment, and this is an all ceramic lithium disilicate crown, but that's not what I'm highlighting. In this particular case, in this situation, using a provisional abutment and crown, this emergence profile on the buckle, it worked. But the same thing is not true for this patient, in this case. In this case, this is a gold UCLA custom abutment, all ceramic crown, but this emergent profile, that worked. And then in this one, so this it has a concavity. This is straight and has a gooseneck design. And here, we have almost a straight emergence profile. The sharing of the emergence profile of the abutment and crown. Well, just in the past three months, the literature is lighting up on, on this topic in particular. When do you use one versus another? How does it work? Does it work? So now we're really getting into facial, powder or lingual, and proximal emergence profiles of both the crown, critical contour, abutment, subcritical contour, what works, what doesn't work. This is the money. This is finally, we're getting there. So again, Furhauser said, you Americans, all you care about is bleach white teeth. Not true. Tissue is the issue. So th this is the, the final case, and, and this is after several years. You could see that this is the implant crown. Nice. But this is the thing that Furhauser and others talk about, and that's the gingival index. Here, he has a pink score of one through nine. We have papilla, uh, almost 100%, not so good here, maybe 60%. We have free gingival margins. I want you to be critical and looking at these cases. We have root eminence. We have color, texture, fullness, all these issues. In this case, seven this concavity worked. But in this case, that concavity worked. And again, several years later, uh, this is a all ceramic crown. This is the design that worked best here. And I was only able to do that with a provisional, testing it out, adding, subtracting. And again, the straight profile worked best here. We see stippling, free gingival margins level and even, almost 100% uh, papilla fill, good root eminence, good stippling, good color. Then this straight profile worked here. And I'm gonna show you the last two articles in the literature review describes these differences in great detail. Finally, we have the literature backing what we've done for the past several decades. So, you know, when I lecture around, people go, do you cement? Do you screw? Or if you're so confused, do you screw and cement? You, you can do any one of those three. So again, I'm talking about emergence profile. Here, we have a nice shared emergence profile by the crown and abutment. 
This is a cement retained case. When you treat an implant, you want to know what you're doing before you place your implant. The next is a screw retained, which I particularly like here. Low anterior teeth, you don't got a lot of room. If you have a custom abutment and you want to cement, there's not a lot left to that abutment. So I like to screw retain on lower anterior teeth. And again, you know, th this is someone that really hasn't made up their mind. Do they want to screw? Do they want to cement? Let's do both. Kim Knoll talked about, Kim was spot on. So this person came in right before COVID. This was actually done in someone's mouth, Kim. And, and they came in, th this is a person that owns, and, and you have to be aware of people. He, the elevator maintenance, he, he owns the maintenance company that repairs all the elevators in the DC area. So elevators are big business. And, and the money was not an issue for this guy. What, what the issue was that this restoration was just placed a year ago. And he came in and he said to me, Doc, every month they're tightening the screw because the screw keeps on loosening. And the reason why the screw keeps on loosening is the size, the implant positioning. I mean, th this is ridge lap to the max. So what happens when, when you have poor placement and you have a ridge lap design, you have poor biomechanics, you get screw loosening, eventually you get screw fracture, and eventually you get implant failure. You can't clean this, you get peri-implantitis. This is just a no-win situation. So planning matters. But I did this case. And I restored this case with somebody that didn't guide, that didn't use a CT, that used freehand technology, and it's basically wrong. So this is a case that I did, that I tried to make work, and, and this is a five-year follow-up. How's the papilla? How's the emergence profile? None of it ideal, none of it good. So, so guided technology, planning, makes all the difference in the world for optimizing emergence profile. Ideal, that's what the Renaissance Te Study Club is shooting for. Ideal, crown, critical contour, subcritical abutment, shared emergence profile. Here we could see, this is replacing a natural tooth and we're sharing the emergence profile. Whether it's a central, a lateral, we are mimicking nature's root replacement. But my kids say, you can't always get what you want. So we have to use pink porcelain for less than ideal situations. And here, when you're missing tooth, soft tissue and bone, this is a very old case. And, and uh, this is something that I did as a bailout. This is an older person. They had gone through grafting. But, um, you know, when you're 80-something years old, um, this was the best years ago that I could offer this person. Um, fortunately, they, uh, they passed on with the restoration of mouth. But this is not ideal. And again, less than ideal, pink can be used uh, in place of soft tissue, but uh, this is not what we're shooting for, okay? But again, when all else fails, uh, pink can be your answer to help us with emergence profile problems when you lack bone and soft tissue. Okay. So let's start from the beginning. And in an emergence profile, it all starts with planning. So, so our W and I, you know, the only way we do it is through virtual treatment planning and guided implant placement. But then the big question is, and, and this was 
three leaders in the field were asked this question in compendium uh, this summer, July and August 2020. Why has dentistry resisted widespread adoption of computer-assisted implant surgery guided implant placement? Why? And, and I think Gary, who has published the longest, uh, he's an oral surgeon up in Westchester, New York. Uh, he was one of the early pioneers in guided and publishing his results. His office uh, it has several oral surgeons, and they documented their cases. They've been, uh, they've been guiding and documenting now for 20 plus years. This is something they believed in, but it's not widespread throughout the world, and it needs to be. The Renaissance, we've been pushing guided technology for a long time. Um, Gary says, time, money, but mostly fear, are preventing us from using this technology, guided implant placement, routinely. And, and I know in my practice, uh, our practice, then, then this is something we do all the time. But it does take time. And as Gary said, to make impressions, either digital or conventional, the workup take time. It takes time for a W to call me and say, can you get on and let's treat and plan together? It definitely takes time. To me, it's absolutely a must. There's no other way but guided implant placement for many reasons. Money, does it take longer? That's debatable. <laughs> uh, XNAB, dynamic, guided, is very cost effective. But um, you know, with anything else, there's a learning curve and that's the fear, uh, the fear in trying something new. So I thought this was a, a nice uh, a overview on, on why people aren't guiding. But we're not talking about the average person. The Renaissance Study Club for 30 years has, has really represented the top 1% in our industry. So we're talking about shooting for excellence in implant dentistry. So why don't you guide your cases? Well, we do. Every implant, every patient, every time. Not for the special ones, but for everybody. Okay. The next article is what we're gonna delve in an emergence profile. Implant restorations, also compendium. This is the following month, September of 2020. Implant restorations, establishing a proper emergence profile. Man, I, 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 I thought Bashari wrote a really fantastic overview on, on, on where we are in establishing proper emergence profile. I thought it was an excellent article. So a nice overview. Um, let's delve a little deeper. We talked about mesiodistal buccolingual placement, but now I'm gonna talk about depth and something that we've been consistent on, the depth. I believe that three to four millimeters is ideal placement of your platform. And why is that ideal? We need enough running room to develop a proper emergence profile. So we don't have those ridge lop cases. I'll show you. And then I disagree with Bashari. Bashari thinks three to four millimeters anterior and then he says two to three millimeters posterior. Well, Bashari, whether it's anterior or posterior, I still think the number needs to be three to four millimeters to get a nice gradual emergence profile. Because the cross section of teeth is triangular, rhomboidal, ovoid, depending upon what tooth you're replacing. The challenge is implants are round. The, the equalizer is the abutment. They need time and distance to create a nice gradual emergence profile. So mesiodistal dimension, buccolingual dimension needs that gradual emergence profile. Keith? Yeah. There's a question about virtual treatment planning and someone's asking, um, since it's so hard to see images on CTs, 
and even SDL files as far as depth planning, how can you use a static guide versus what's the advantage of dynamic navigation versus a static guide? So wait, did you ask this question? No, I did not. No, Dr. Emery, this sounds like a Dr. Emery question. <laughs> Go ahead. So, you so why, what's the big deal? Uh, the big deal is you can't make these decisions except for when you're doing surgery, right? You can't make that decision because you gotta look at soft tissue and where the isthmus is on the soft tissue. And so there's a gigantic advantage in, in dynamic navigation because you can change everything and you really can't change it with static guidance. But where did we learn from? We learned it from static guides. Absolutely. Yeah, and, there's nothing wrong with a static guide. Correct. And for years, you and I learned as a surgeon and restorative dentist a lot from the static guide. Now, the major advantage for the dynamic, you could make game time decisions there that have major impacts. But the difference between freehand and static guides. You won't get those mesial distal and those buccal lingual problems that you get with freehand. Freehand's just awful. So to me, freehand, you're not even in the game. You're in the game with a static guide and it's acceptable. But you're a world champion or you're a winner when you have dynamic navigation. But but the dynamic navigation doesn't make you a better clinician. No, it doesn't. You need the opportunity to really be a master at what you do. Agreed? Yep. Biggest problem is treatment planning. So let's talk about treatment planning. Too small, size matters, not deep enough. So, so the restoration that I had to do that eventually failed was it was not deep enough. Its position was poor. How come? No planning, freehand. Here's your implant ready to be restored. The second case over here that's X, same thing. This is a noble active implant. Someone got really excited, placed the implant, but there was no restorative input. Any decision making, any input on what kind of implant, size, position, placement, none of that. So hygiene becomes an issue and health. Food collection, food impaction, peri-implantitis, fractured screws, loose screws, fractured abutments, loss of implant. So as in this article, the greatest challenges in developing ideal emergence profile is choosing the proper diameter implant and placement. Shallow is a kiss of death. Shallow doesn't give us enough running room. So again, whether it's anterior or posterior, you need enough running room to develop the distance between the implant platform and the proximal contacts of the adjacent T. You need that distance, three to four millimeters, so you have a gradual emergence profile. Again, guided, ideal, gradual. Three-dimensional, buccolingual, mesiodistal, proximal. Okay, something that we've been doing is navigated prosthetics. So we're not just guiding our implant placement, but now we're guiding soft tissue healing. So before the tooth is taken out, that image is, is captured of the cross-sectional diameter of the root that we're replacing. Then Dr. Emery uses anatotemps or, or any one of those uh, technologies to create the root replacement in a customized healing component. And that's what you see there. Customized healing component. Like these, these develop, these preserve the soft tissue profile. So when you look at the final crowns on the slide on the right, you go, nice crowns. They must be supported by teeth, not implants. So there's you, a new, there's a new, uh, iteration of this that now includes this now has become a scan body. So this is going to be released in a couple of uh, probably about a week. 
and there are uh, marks in the occlusal surface of these so that you don't have to take them out to take an, uh, an impression with an intraoral scanner. And the STL files of these below in the subemergence, unless you uh, change them, which you can do, is uh, available to the labs so they can match it up. So your tissue can be maturing at the same time and you don't have to take them off. So it's a lot like an ENCODE. So wait, it's, so the scan body captures the implant timing and position. Yep. But your library of this pre-contoured uh, uh, emergence profile of the soft tissue is kept yep. in the library. And you can make changes to it. More concave, more support, whatever you want to do in designing your file above it. Right. If you if you change it, if you change it, you're going to have to take an impression, a sub sub tissue impression. If you don't change it, you can use the STL files that come with the uh, abutment. So it's a real, I, th I think it's a game changer because one of the issues, again, Keith talked about it, is is the same sustainability of the model as far as it relates to the cost. If you have to spend $100 on one of these or an hour making one, it's not, that's not a sustainable business model for something that you're going to throw away. So the a whole idea of these pre-contoured quote unquote custom abutments is that you can get everything you want from a printed abutment and you can change it if you want, but you don't have to. Um, so it, I think it's something that's realistic. I'm going to make a comment you know, Keith and I was looking at the literature. The ADA had a, a, a really interesting article that we'll talk about later at another meeting. And they were talking about innovation in dentistry in the last five years. And I picked it up and I thought I'd be reading about things like XNAV and, and uh, scanning and things like that. And you know what they were talking about? Business models. Because what are we all doing? And this is related to Jamie and everybody else and in the future. We're working on the top, you know, five, 10% of patients, or maybe the top 20%. There's this gigantic, gigantic group of people who don't benefit from our care. And if we don't figure out how to, and in the future doesn't figure out how to take care of people with more efficiency, at the level of care that we want, then we're leaving people behind. And so when anytime we create this kind of new technology, we have to figure out how to make it cost effective and efficient. And I, that's what I'm really looking at now. I think it's well, super important. That because that's the last slide. The last slide is exactly that. So, so this is a case that our W uh, um, uh, guided, dynamic guided, and his accuracy is so good now. We're, we're at you know half a millimeter, uh, half a millimeter accuracy in placement, and and you could see it's just it's just beautiful between the buccal and lingual cortical plates depth. Our planning to the actual it, it is virtually the same, virtually, and so we're able to do guided prosthetics because the precision and accuracy is so good. And we're able to guide this soft tissue healing uh, when we couldn't do that before. All our componentry was round. Nothing in the body is round. Just our implants, artificial. So this was designed and made ahead of time. And that's what uh, the article talks about, is custom healing abutments or, and temporary crowns, but, but is capturing and preserving the emergence profile. And then conveying that obviously to the lab, like our W just said, a digital scan of the soft tissue, or as I just mentioned, using a scan body impression. That's what they're doing. That enables a soft tissue model to develop uh, emergence profile intraorally. So to mimic uh, the natural tooth emergence profile. That's what we're doing. And therefore we're able to then translate it to the final abutments either machine mill titanium or here in this uh, custom 
uh, uh, gold abutments. And again, the shared emergence profile is, is almost identical to what we had in the customized healing components. And we're able to do that, and therefore, when we deliver these cases, there's no compression of the soft tissue, there's no expansion, it's literally a one-for-one -one relationship. And when we try in the abutments and we try in the crowns, you look at the soft tissue profile, this is the day of insertion. And you say, is this a tooth uh, with a crown, a natural tooth, or is this an implant? And, and that's how consistently good we're getting. Again, you could customize it or companies now are coming out with prefabricated emergence profile components. So this is at the time of implant placement, and you, you could select your sizes, your shapes, the tooth that we're replacing, and eventually we'll have a whole library of products depending upon where you are in the mouth and, and what site you're replacing. This happens to be Nobel, but all the companies are coming out with this, this is prefab, and then this kind of emergence profile is then replicated in the final product. Same, one for one. Again, same kind of system. These are all prefabricated components. At the time the implant's placed, not round, but have decent natural emergence profile. It's then mimicked in the final abutment, and then when we place these abutments, there's no compression of the soft tissue. There's no healing. It's one for one. Okay. Now, Armando, this is for you. And, and this is relating to, to what size implant do we need? Where should the implant be? This is an older case. And there's a, a common misconception that emergence profile is controlled solely through the choice of the implant diameter, especially in the posterior zone. And, and size does matter here. Um, so again, if you could see the slide on the right, the implant platform is purple, blue, um, and then th that's this diameter. But your occlusal table, where you get your occlusion and load and contact is in red. It's called the intercuspal distance. And then your yellow is your crown contour that deflects food, so you don't get food impaction, and you can see a gradual transition from your implant platform, a gradual transition into your emergence profile and, and your critical crown contour, even posterior. So we don't get food collection and we resist forces correctly. Now, now I threw this slide in because I'm doing this more and more for COVID. COVID had changed the world in, in my practice. And during COVID, I pretty much saw emergencies only, and that was fractured teeth. So the endodontists were extremely busy uh, because people were fracturing in my practice and in other practices. In the New York Times article, people were, and still are, social, political unrest, pandemic, you name it, wildfires, and people are clenching, grinding their teeth. So in response to that, I'm doing more screwy teamed prosthesis. And here, the key to the screwy teamed prosthesis is metal all the way up to the occlusal to support the porcelain. So I don't want porcelain in the chimney. And then, and then I showed this slide to Jamie during COVID. I didn't miss the opportunity not to teach my son dentistry. Uh, so I had a lecture of one, and uh, Jamie, this is, uh, this is good tertiary anatomy on a lawyer, typical in our practice, um, that has brutalized their occlusion and their occlusal anatomy, and there's virtually nothing left. To say that a night guard alone or occlusal guard is going to protect this person, um, it's not going to happen. So the other little things that you can do is narrow the occlusal table. So the cus tips here are similar cus tips to premolars. And here they can't get to overloading that implant 
because we've now just narrowed the occlusal table. We have metal collar to support the porcelain, and those little things help uh, people who can't help themselves and who have high anxiety. Even the average person now has is stressed and has high anxiety. So these are little tips. More screw retained, narrow the occlusal table, a lot of metal support in the chimney and at the cervical margin. Okay, uh, third to last article is Modern Treatment Solutions for Immediate Aesthetic Implants. This is Evan Chavis, an oral surgeon, quite an oral surgeon in Westchester. He, pu he published this uh, clinical case report uh, during COVID. Uh, a 19 year old person was walking um, to get a medical procedure done. They had a syncopole episode in his, in, in his office building in Westchester. They fell, they fainted, and they fractured their central incisor. He then described in great detail immediate placement and immediate provisionalization. Um, and he, he utilized, and obviously he's promoting the BLX Strauman implant. But I really thought this was a nice case report on something that just happened. So let's go through the 10% the, the, the of the time that you could place an immediate placed implant and immediate provisional. These are the little criteria, flapless, no flap, fully guided surgery. You want to graph the gap when you place the implant. If you can, you'll place a customized provisional abutment. You also want to place a connective tissue graph. You want to tuck it to the facial. Again, you want to graph the gap with bone graft material. And then you want to make an immediate provisional. This is all based on the uh, immediate placement and provisionalization in a type one socket with intact buccal cortical plate. This is the immediate provisional. And after six to nine months of healing, lab work, this is the final product. So again, when all these criteria are met, you can do this as in Evan's case. Some of the criteria for immediate placement and here, immediate loading. Uh, again, you know, insertion torque value has to be high. Your implant stability quotient, your OSTEL, an absolute presence of the buccal cortical plate, steep, deep occlusion, not great. Medical history, smoking, to name some. Someone has to be compliant, we'll talk about. And, and I really like Dan Boozer because um, Again, he too, eight to 10% of the cases, uh, he says, we're able to place an implant immediately. You obviously wanna avoid the buccal cortical plate. You wanna place it more towards the palatal and you wanna place it at or level with the mid facial uh, crest. Graph the gap. And again, this is the emergence profile on an immediate provisional, immediate placed implant that you need. You want sub contour or concave profile. And this profile is critical in maintaining soft tissue profile. So, so again, concave. It's short, it's concave. You don't want to put any pressure on that free gingival margin. So our W, nothing is new. Everything is old, but revisited. And again, th this was the Nitsan Bachacho implant. This is then the Noble Active implant. This is now the Strauman BLX implant. And their claim is that they will get early integration. They'll get a higher bone to implant contact that we now can load our implants sooner. But, but we've seen this in 30 years that no matter the bioactive surface, to me, there's always a dip in two to four weeks after the implant's placed, no matter what implant and surface. And, and it really depends upon the quality of bone that exists, no matter the implant surface or macro thread design. So I'm gonna comment on, there's 
a couple of new implants and they're, as you said, revisiting the past. And there's some issues with this stuff. And what were the issues with the old active? Because these are, this is actually designed by the person that and designed the active. You see the size of this implant body, okay? And the two parallel lines. And then you see the diameter of the threads. So for one twist of one of these implants, you're gonna move vertically almost two millimeters. What leads to failure the most? Inaccurate implant position, okay? So you have a super aggressive implant. This implant's gonna bounce around because the diameter of the osteotomy is the diameter of that body. The implant threads are gonna hit the most dense object and the maxilla it's typically the palatal bone in the mandible it's typically the lingual bone and so what happens when those threads hit that bone they're going to bounce off the bone and let's just pick the maxilla where it really matters in the aesthetic zone where is that implant going to go buckle where you don't That's want the word, where when you drive it in even if you guide your hole in the perfect place, where is it gonna go? It's gonna go buckle. So you're gonna also tear up the buckle bone perfect with these large aggressive threads. And I don't know how many of you remember with some of the issues we had with active implants until we learned how to use them. And so these implants, they're great in the right place. If you got a big man, with gigantic alveolus with thick morphotype and square teeth, go ahead, do it. What does that make up? As Keith said, the immediate cases that we're supposed to do if we follow the literature is about 20%. I'm being, I'm being generous of yeah. all the cases we do. Good and then you should, and the, otherwise you're gonna have bad results and they'll work, they'll integrate. And even if you put tissue in, They'll look good initially for a couple of years. And then you look down the road, five, 10 years, and what are you looking at? Thin tissue and defects and bad aesthetics. And if you get unlucky, you're, gonna, you're not even gonna be able to restore the case. The other thing is what's going on right now. There's this battle between single drill and multiple drill, okay? There's, uh, there's a group of people that say you only drill once, and we're going to be talking about this stuff later. One drill, and then you place your implant. That's a, that's a, that's, I'm not, I'm not going to name names of implant companies. And there's some really smart people saying you drill once, you get better integration. Well, what if you drill once wrong, and your implant's going in the wrong place? What if you got multiple drills to work with? You got multiple times to correct your osteotomy. So there's, there's no free lunch <laughs> if you make a mistake right away and you don't guide, you're toast. You got to back off if you got a single drill. So all this stuff has it, you know, it's, there's the upside, there's the downside. I'm a, I'm a little more about slow and methodical and being predictable. So I'm not jumping on this bandwagon yet. Everybody's going the same direction. And it's just reinventing some old issues. So we'll see how it works out. Maybe I'm wrong. But I One indication is uh, grafting, type four bone, sinus grafting. I'm not talking about early loading. I'm talking about waiting the full four to six months, grafting four to six months, implant placement four to six months. But maybe you could have better improved bone to implant contact with softer bone, not to accelerate not, not to uh, uh, play with science, but actually maybe you'll get more bone to, uh, to integrate, maybe. So that, that's what was done here. Again, with these BLX implants, you're talking machine mill titanium, no uh, peak material, no uh, gold UCLA thus far. And again, broad proximal contact areas to prevent food collection. Okay, natural tooth implant restoration. Let's talk about uh, the last two articles that we have. 
and uh, we've gone through uh, almost 11 articles. Um, this is my buddy, or, uh, we're not talking about anything controversial, Ernesto Lee. Ernesto was the chairman of the Department of Perioprostate Pen. Um, he came out with Arnie Weisgeld and others 10 years ago, uh, even greater, but this article came out and talks about critical and subcritical crown contours, crown and abutment, crown or critical, subcritical abutment, beautiful emergence profile by Ernesto. And again, this article that he published with these people, excellent, was 2010. They have since taken that concept and published in 2020, a now revision to that and, and even much greater detail. So let's talk about contour management of implant restorations, a second to last, optimum emergence profiles, immediate delayed provisional. This is a very important concept and really hot on the lecture circuit right now. So in 2020, they take critical and subcritical emergence profiles and, and, and come up with some guidelines for immediate, how can we preserve what, what nature has given us and, and provisionalize it right away? Or do we delay and try to regenerate that soft tissue profile? That's the question. That's the 2020 question. Again, he talks about subcritical contour, which is your emergence profile of your abutment, and your critical contour, nature's clinical crown. And again, he talks about this regenerative space, which is very interesting to allow for room. And again, immediate, we don't want to preserve exactly the shape and contour of, of your uh, rhomboid, your ovoid, your triangular form, whatever tooth that we're restoring or replacing immediately, don't lose it, or delay and try to regenerate later. Two different techniques. This is a case that uh, John Shefferman, our W and I did, and I just want you to see the, the crown, the shared emergence profile of the clinical crown and abutment and how it has this gooseneck design that worked well in this case. Uh, and this was uh, an immediate provisional screw retain that we did to develop that kind of soft tissue profile. And then we mimic that in the final restoration. Screw retain, lateral incisor to develop that soft tissue profile uh, during our orthodontic treatment. We needed that soft tissue profile because she had such a high smile line. This was in her aesthetic zone, so, um, so that was critical. And we'll kind of go through it. This is her later, several years later, she's done with college, very consistent, very predictable, very long lasting. You're able to maintain that soft tissue. The Furhauser score, again, 100% fill, 60, 70% fill, Good root eminence, level frigidal margins, nice color. So, so Ernesto, Arnie Weisgeld, and others talks about routinely the emergence profile of the abutment is concave facial, interproximal, and palatal as much as possible. You want to allow room for soft tissue. That is their thing. If you keep it flat, you may maintain it. If you over contour it and make it convex, you'll put pressure on the soft tissue and you'll get recession. So the whole point in the article on immediate provisional restorations is to preserve it by under contouring and making that abutment concave in the, in the immediate and in the final. The crown contour of the, of the crown you also want under contoured on the facial. On the interproximal, you want it equal to the natural tooth to create a nice running room so that from your contact point to crest, you'll have a papilla. And again, on the palatal, you, you want to support that soft tissue on the palate so it doesn't collapse. Okay? So those are the three parameters that they go through on, on abutment and crown contour. We're getting details now 
on when to preserve it immediately versus delayed. And again, that's what I illustrated in this case. Um, I have a long contact area interproximal. You can't really see the palatal. It's, it's similar to the actual tooth. But here, the critical aspect is the crown and abutment are concave. They're under contoured to allow soft tissue proliferation on the immediate. And again, that's the final restoration. Immediate six months of osseointegration and soft tissue maturation, three to four months of lab work, soft tissue work, and that's what you get at uh, eight to nine months. And something that's important there is, if you see the suture there, that's because there's a connective tissue graft in that socket. Yes, bone to graft the gap and a connective tissue. And again, interproximal, this is only a two-dimensional radiograph, but interproximal, you, you want to go straight, and again, straight to the contact point. And you want to support that papilla. You can't see facial, you're always going to have a concavity. On the abutment, um, you want to concave to allow for soft tissue. Keith? I took a course from Bill Strupp years ago, and he talked about this negative contour on provisionals and finals. And at the gingival down to the margin, a negative contour is going to allow that gingiva to fall into there and maintain a nice, healthy, long-term uh, result from the gingival. Strupp called it a negative contour. He's, he's, this is years ago I took this course, but it just makes sense. This is not a new concept. Barnett has been talking about this since the 60s. Form follows function. Build it and they will come. So, so this concept is perioprost, long time. But now we're starting to get, you know, more specific. Facial, palatal, proximal. When do we do it initially? Do we regain it later? What's the best way to do this? So, so absolutely the case. I don't agree with Strupp. All of these people uniformly say you don't necessarily want to under contour the final crown. You want it to mimic the adjacent teeth or the natural teeth. The critical aspect is the subcritical area. And, and that's the emergence profile of the abutment. Again, facially concave. Mm -hmm straight to support the soft tissue. We're, we're, Kim, we're finally getting details. And, and they're doing this with large data. You'll see in the next literature, it's just amazing. So that was empirical because while Bill Strupp was, was an amazing clinician, that's case reports. But now we're getting into big data on, on how to do this based on science. Good. Okay, so, so again, this is now for delayed. It gets a little more complicated because now we've lost some of the soft tissue and now we want to regain that three-dimensional profile, facial, palatal, and interproximal. So again, the cr critical contour, that's what the crown looks like. The subcritical is your abutment. Pretty much uniformly, the subcritical, flat or slightly concave, uniformly, only convex w when, when you need to move it. And again, you know, equal to the natural teeth, interproximal, and, and palatal. So again, same for delayed. Uh, and, and different than Bill Strupp, the final crown contour should be the same as the natural teeth, all the way around. So you really want to adjust the abutment crown contour to dictate soft tissue dimensions. Okay. So what does that mean? I, I, I thought I showed this a couple of years ago to you guys. This is one of the few cases that I did of a, a lithium disilicate abutment. But it really illustrates the point of this uh, concavity for soft tissue profile. So, so here we have the abutment, 
and it's concave on the facial and it's slightly concave interproximal, but then it turns straight to the contact. And now we have a long contact area. So this concavity is reflective of me seating this abutment. You can see by seating this abutment that underneath the soft tissue, it's concave. It's under profiled as Bill Strupp said. So this, this abutment is not fully seated. I'm about to seat that. And you can see that it's much more narrow and it's much more concave. And then I'm gonna seat it, okay? That's what you want to support that soft tissue profile long-term. Everybody see that? This is not fully seated, okay? And then I'm gonna fully seat it. So it's under contour, exactly like, uh, like they said. So what does that mean? That means that three years later, she comes back from McGill University and the soft tissue is perfect. Young person, perfect. So, so we got 100% fill, almost 100%. Nice, this is the difference, Kim. Level fringe or margins. If this crown is under contour, you may not get level regional margins. We want that crown to be identical to the natural teeth. And therefore, we have excess soft tissue here, and that's what you see long term. Good root eminence, good step length, good color. So three years will now turn into 13 years, and we're able to maintain that. So that's what they're talking about. Straight or slightly concave interproximal. And facial, always concave. Okay. The last is the best. And, and it's called restorative emergence profile for single tooth implants in healthy periodontal patients and it's guidelines. But, but to me, this is the best of the best. This is Stephen Chu, NYU, and private practice. Joe Kahn, Loma Linda, Ernesto uh, uh, at Philly. Layla is our department chair at NYU. Myron Nevins up in Boston. And then we got a, uh, a Michigan person. These people are educators. They're talking about, they're talking about restorative emergence profile, REP. This is in a natural tooth is different in an implant restorative emergence profile. And that's what we're talking about. This area is different in implants. So ideally, in, in, in natural teeth, this is a root. We have, we have all the attachment and our crown should be identical to natural teeth. But implants are different. And they're saying because they're different, our abutment, needs to be different design, identical to what Ernesto just published. So let's talk about it. We talk about this subcritical area, concave, concave, concave. In this case, that's the concavity. You could see it facially, concave, interproximally straight to support the papilla. So now we're getting in those details. So ideal implant position, three to four millimeters, anterior, posterior, doesn't matter. You need enough running room. Slightly palatal, again, to avoid the buccal cortical plate. And again, this is what it looks like long-term. Good papilla fill, level regional margins, great root eminence, great color. Long-term, that's what you get when you design subcritical, and critical contour. Okay, but then we have our W, and our W always changes the rules for us, and he gets involved into partial extraction techniques or root shields, our W. So, so this is critical now. In designing your subcritical or, or abutment emergence profile and crown, you can't flare things. You can't flare the abutment, you can't flare the crown, or else you'll run in 
to your root shield. So this is a root shield case. Uh, a, a little piece of root was left, submerged, and I should not flare the abutment in the provisional or the final. And you could see that this is concave. And you could see that the final crown core contour is slightly under contour for allow for the soft tissue. So instead of the regenerative space, think of a root shield. Think of a piece of a root. We don't want a flare to interfere with that root. So same kind of technology, concave, concave, especially when RW or all the other clinicians say, I want to keep a part of a root. I want to do a root shield. They need to tell you that so that you know how to design the temporary abutment and the final abutment and final crown. So with the root shields, depending on the philosophy of the surgeon that's doing it, it's a bit controversial. The level of the shield is going to either be just about a millimeter above the crest of the bone or at the level of the crest of the bone. If it's at the level of the crest of the bone, it's not going to change what you do much. Much. If it's, a, if it's above the level of the crest of the bone, it could be problematic. The one thing that I would say is that if you do a root shield case, make sure you do a screw retained restoration because the one complication that everyone does talk about is exposed roots. If the surgeon makes a mistake and leaves a little bit of root above the edge, if you have a screw retained, you can unscrew it and you just take a nut, a burr, and you cut down that little bit of, bone, of root. Um, there's a lot going on with this. There's a lot of controversy with this. What's the optimal way to doing it? There's even open root shields now. So where they make a flap and they cut the root down to the level of the bone in an open fashion. So what's going to be where we settle with this is going to be interesting over the next five years. But it's definitely something you want to pay attention to. And we'll talk about it more as the year progresses. The other thing is biotype. So, um, and they talk about this in the article. So this is a case that I did many years ago, one of the first zirconia abutments, but that's not what's critical. The zirconia abutment itself is, is concave, but this is a canine implant. This is a canine in the lateral position, something I never want to do. And let's look and see what happens on a thin biotype person um, if there's pressure from the root eminence, what happens to that soft tissue? So, so th this is a canine in the lateral position, something I did not want to do. When it flames, it's bad. 12 years later, there's a cony abutment still there. This is one of the 50% that actually worked. But more important than that, on a thin tissue person, what do you see? You see recession on a natural tooth. So this is the natural tooth in the lateral site, the canine, and already you start to see recession. Do you see any recession 12 years later on the implant restoration? Zero. So if you contour and concave this abutment on, on a high risk person, if their natural tooth is receding, but not their implant restoration. So how critical is it to get the right emergence profile and contour long-term on a thin biotype person, critical in implants? This is 12 year follow-up now. The soft tissue doesn't look good on the natural tooth and it looks even worse on my composite, but my implant crown, abutment and restoration, perfect. Okay, immediate uh, socket preservation, similar to what Ernesto was saying. Do we want to, and, and this is what this article and this study, this study says when you can, don't delay, immediately preserve the socket. And, and that's what the study says. It, it, you'll get minimum changes to the soft tissue, 0.2 millimeters, as opposed to up to one millimeter if you delay. So the answer to your question is, 
Do we preserve that socket immediately? Yes. Do we try to regenerate it and delay that subcritical area? That's what we've done for 30 years. Now we, we know the literature is saying preserve it immediately. Again, th this is a case that preserved it immediately. Here we did a customized uh, uh, healing component in all dimensions. We mimicked the root of the tooth. We preserved it Stephen Chu-esque in the provisional abutment. That's what it looked like in provisional, provisional restoration. This is the final crown abutment, and this is the final crown. Sharing the emergence profile. What does it look like long-term? Two-year follow-up, good. Seven-year follow-up, great. So if you preserve it early on, immediately, it will look better than trying to regenerate it, push on the tissue, recontour it, sculpt the tissue. That's something we've been doing for 30 years. It's better to preserve it immediately, as this case illustrates. Okay, so these five educators came up with guidelines and decision makings on emergence profile. Critical crown contour, what should your crown look like? Subcritical uh, contour, what should your abutment look like? Facial, interproximal, routinely everybody's saying concavity. But this feeds into what our W is saying. This is the Renaissance Study Club, the top 1% in the country. But how do we relate that to everybody in our society? And that's what the future, big data. This case was done in the 1990s. This case was mishandled in 2020. How do we avoid these mistakes? Computers, machine learning, big data input into diagnostic criteria for treatment decisions and long-term outcomes. What we do long-term has outcomes. Anterior, posterior, decision-making. Is this aesthetic? Is this more functional? DICOM, CBCTs getting better at reading thickness of cortical plates, bone volume, quantity and quality. STL files measuring thickness of soft tissue. We have algorithms saying what the biotype, what the emergence profile should look like, and therefore what the final outcome will be for the next 10, 20 years. Determining implant positioning, 3D uh, abutment contour and crown contour, robotics guided, computer generated. This is the future and that's where we're going with computers. And that's exactly what our W was saying. Outcome driven, big data. So in review, clinical decision making based on the current literature, past three months, all those 11 articles, evidence-based science. We went through all 11 articles. It's eight uh, o'clock. All 11 articles. And now we've ended to the second on time. Thank you for our first, first Zoom video meeting of the Renaissance 2020-2021 Study Club. Thank you all for helping me. So Thank you, Keith. again, every, everyone, uh, if you will help out our next speaker, when the emails come to you and they're asking for your input to share your cases for the next meeting, the only way the next meeting is going to be a success is if you all uh, if you all um, contribute, and that's what has made a lot of our meetings so great. I want to thank Keith uh, and Jeannie and Felipe for helping put the meeting together, and for everybody attending. I'm really impressed how many people actually hung in there. <laughs> Going to virtual meetings is tough, and thank you everybody for coming. And uh, we hope you'll be at the yep. next meeting. And again, let's help out uh, our speaker and make sure you contribute a case. It's not that hard. We're going to make it as easy as we can for you. Thanks, Keith. Thank, Thank you. Keith. Thank you. Mask, be safe. Be healthy. Hi.
Thank Thanks, you. guys. Good job. Thank you, Keith. Thank that was you. tremendous. Thanks, Much appreciated. Thanks, guys. Bye, Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.